Good evening, everyone. You're in the right place at the right time. This is Coast to Coast AM, blasting out of the Mojave Desert like a Scirocco, blazing across the land, slamming into your radio like a supercharged nanoparticle of unobtainium. Greetings from the boldest, bawdiest, most outrageous city in the world, the planetary capital of sun, fun, sin, sex, and secrets, my not-so-humble hometown, Las Vegas, Nevada. My name is George Knapp, your occasional host, designated driver of the airwaves and moderator of tonight's upcoming cacophonous cavalcade of conversation. What's shaking out there? Ladies and gents, I spent a few days in Texas this past week visiting some friends in Austin, and I was pretty surprised to find Central Texas every bit as hot and miserable as Las Vegas at this time of year. I mean, yikes. Kind of had it in my head I'd get a break from the heat by traveling east, but as soon as I walked outside the airport and into that air, I was reminded of the massive heat dome that's baking the middle of the country. Add to that temperature, the humidity that we don't have here in the Mojave, and man, that was brutal. I was even glad to get back to the normal oven-like conditions of Nevada after that trip, but uh, I'm huddled inside an air-conditioned, fortified bunker for tonight's extravaganza, so we're cool, literally and maybe figuratively. Hope the same is true for you wherever you are. Tonight, we'll hear from two guests who are known for taking things into their own hands, boots on the ground kind of guys, or in one case, boots on the ocean. I don't know how many of you have sort of tuned out the waves of grim news about the oceans that we've been reading for months and months. There are stories almost every day, and it becomes a bit overwhelming, I think, to absorb the onslaught of bad news. But ignoring it won't make it go away. Uh, The high temperatures that fuel powerful storms and hurricanes uh, that deplete oxygen to the point that it's these massive fish, fish kills that are popping up, coral reefs in serious trouble, major species just vanishing, humans still hunting and killing whales, for gosh sakes. Major shark species are being slaughtered by the millions for their fins so people can make soup. But the news isn't all grim. Dedicated people can make a difference, are making a difference, and as evidence for that, we'll be talking with one of the best-known, most successful ocean activists and environmentalists in history. He has confronted the worst of the worst out there on the high seas, co-founded two of the best-known organizations dedicated to protect the oceans and ocean creatures, and has literally put his life on the line many times for causes that you and I only read about. Captain Paul Watson co-founded a couple of different organizations that you will know by name, He's here to tell us about the challenges ahead, what victories have been won, and how we can all get involved. Captain Watson joins us in just a couple of minutes. Then in the second half tonight, we meet an explorer of a different sort. Malcolm Robinson has written 12 books about unusual phenomena based on real incidents throughout the U.K. His latest work is a massive volume of weird stuff. We'll be taking a deep dive into those investigations And we'll be going live to Great Britain coming up two hours from now. Uh, Webmaster Lex Lonehood and I have put together our usual assortment of items and oddities culled from news media around the world. We call it Naps News. You can find it only on the Coast to Coast AM website. Among the stories there tonight, since we're going to be chatting about aquatic creatures, there's a Reuters report about something happening this weekend. What might be the largest organized hunt for Nessie ever conducted? I guess a bunch of curious folks have descended on Loch Ness to see if they can find the legendary, perhaps imaginary beast that is rumored to have been living in the loch for centuries. I kind of have mixed reactions to this. I mean, I tend to doubt they're going to find evidence of such a creature, but if she really is there or her descendants are there, I'd rather they left her alone, you know, wouldn't you? Also, news of an amazing discovery in the Pacific Ocean about 80 miles west of Monterey Bay out there in the ocean, a real-life octopus's garden an amazing octopus nursery of sorts, a spot where thousands and thousands of these amazing animals are living. They've congregated. They're raising their young and relative safety. It's a terrific story, but I guess now that humans have found out where it is, the clock might be ticking on when someone's going to decide to find it and harvest a bunch of these peaceful octopi. I, I don't know how they could be protected way out there. Maybe Paul Watson will have some thoughts on it. We have two very serious stories about current predictions and projections about the oceans, what might happen to ocean currents, what happens to all of us if these changes come to pass. It's serious stuff. We need to pay attention to it. Also, a story about some scientists who think they can punch a hole through to another dimension, create a portal of sorts 
right out of a sci-fi novel. And, of course, what could go wrong with that? Those stories and more in NAPS News. And while you're there on the website, find out how to become a Coast Insider. The cost is about 15 cents a day. If you subscribe for a year, it gives you access to a vast archive of programs and interviews, including the Art Bell Vault. You can listen anytime you want, as often as you want, on the device of your choice. It's a great deal. So, too, is a subscription to Beyond Belief. That's George Norrie's television program, which George interviews fascinating guests on scintillating topics, similar to what he does so well here on the radio. So check that out. With that, let's assume the position. Bring in the dog and the cat. Sprinkle some treats in the tank for the tropical fish. Put on a pot of joe. Slide your bod into the silky summer jambies and your toes into your best bunny slippers. Plop yourself down in that big barca lounger. Turn down the lights and turn up the radio because we're about ready to rumble. In a moment, we go on a seafaring adventure with Captain Paul Watson. I'm George Knapp, and this is Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. Captain Paul Watson is a marine wildlife conservation and environmentalist specialist. Uh, He was one of the founding members and directors of Greenpeace, is a renowned speaker, accomplished author, master mariner, and lifelong environmentalist. He's been awarded many honors for his dedication to the oceans and the planet. He was named one of the top 20 environmental heroes of the 20th century by Time Magazine. He was inducted into the U.S. Animal Rights Hall of Fame in Washington, D.C. in 2002. In 2012, he became only the second person after Captain Jacques Cousteau to be awarded the Jules Verne Award dedicated to environmentalists and adventurers. And in 2023, earlier this year, Captain Watson continued his fight for marine wildlife conservation by creating the new Captain Paul Watson Foundation. Captain Watson, great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. My pleasure. I can't imagine you'll remember this, but back when you and I both had much darker hair, I interviewed you for KLAS-TV here in Las Vegas. might have been 82 or 83, I think, the early days of the Sea Shepherds, and I was impressed with it then, and my opinion certainly hasn't changed in the decades since. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, you know, I imagine people have wildly varying opinions about you and the work you've done to people and industries, you know, that have been the target of your activism likely think you're a pirate uh, you know a criminal needs to be put behind bars maybe sent to davy jones's locker and i believe they tried to do both of those things um and i think regular folks who care about the oceans and creatures uh, regard you as a crusader or hero you're you're comfortable wearing both of those hats i'd imagine well yes actually officially i am a pirate in 2014 judge alex kaczynski of the ninth circuit court federal court uh called me labeled me a pirate although i wasn't <laughs> accused or charged with piracy, but uh, he did that because of our opposition to Japanese whaling operations in the Southern Ocean, which he said was uh, an act of piracy when we stopped them from doing their illegal activities down there. You know, we've heard stories about uh, uh, ships uh, that get rammed, these whaling ships that get rammed by activists. That's you, right? You did that stuff. Well, they ram us, we ram them, so it goes both ways. I know that you, I read an article about you parting ways with Greenpeace and then I guess with Sea Shepherds as well. And we have nothing bad to say about either of those organizations, but did they come to the feeling that maybe you're too radical for them? They wanted you to calm down? Well, in the case of Greenpeace, it was more politics than anything else. But um, I was actually uh, voted off the board of directors because in 1977, I pulled a seal club from a sealer's hand and threw it in the water. And they said that that was too aggressive. And I said, well, I was there to save the lives of the SEALs, and I, I did. And if I had to do it over again, I'd do it over again. And they said, well, we don't approve of that kind of behavior. And I said, well, okay, I'll just go set up my own organization. And I established a, an approach which I call aggressive nonviolence, <clears throat> which means we don't hurt anybody, but we aggressively intervene. And in the last 45 years of operations, I've never caused a single injury to a single person, nor have I been convicted of any felony crime. Good. Excellent. They've tried, though, that's for sure. Um, You know, in the course of the next two hours, we're going to talk about some fairly grim news, grim developments. Uh, But before we do that, I wanted to talk about some victories. Save the whales. Uh, That rallying cry, that theme became so ubiquitous 30 years or so ago, it almost became a cliche. And then WAGs responded with nuke the whales and, and funny twists on it. But you really did make some major victories in that fight. Can you take us back to how much of a touch-and-go that particular fight was in the beginning, where things are now, because I know you're still at it, as recently as a few months ago, fighting uh, with whalers in Iceland. So take us back to the beginning and bring us up to date. 
Well, we certainly made a lot of progress. When I began back in 1974, uh, I would say since then about 90% of the world's whaling has been uh, halted. Uh, when we began, Australia, Chile, South Africa, Spain, all of these countries were whaling nations. They no longer do that. So whaling today is now restricted to the territorial waters of Denmark, uh, Norway, Japan, and Iceland. Iceland's the most egregious because uh, they're targeting endangered fin whales. And uh, this summer, uh, we went to Iceland, and within hours of our arrival, the Icelandic government uh, put a temporary ban on, on, on the whaling, which is good, but not so dramatic. And, uh, but it looks like they're going to try and extend that ban uh, or extend that operation for another four years. So we'll be returning next summer to Iceland to once again oppose them. But uh, it's, been a, it's been a long run. I mean, I shut down all the pirate whaling operations in the Atlantic. Uh, we sank half the Spanish whaling fleet in 1980. We sank half the Icelandic whaling fleet in 1986. Uh, so there's been a lot of very dramatic campaigns, but on this, we've made a lot of progress. You, I mean, it's a public education process, too. You've radically changed how people think about whales. I mean, you know... Uh, You know, now they can't imagine how you could possibly track down and hunt and kill these things. It still happens, of course, but it's been it's it represents a major global shift in in the public opinion on these these creatures. Right. How smart they are and how amazing they are. It has. And also back in 2007, I uh, created a television show called Whale Wars, which got a lot of uh, coverage worldwide. And I think that went a long ways to educate people about uh, what's happening with the world's whales. one of the things that people don't really understand about the, the importance of having whales is that, you know, since 1950, we've seen a 40% decline or diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the sea. And phytoplankton provides, these aquatic plants provide up to 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe and sequester enormous amounts of CO2. Now, why is this diminishment happening? And it's because we've uh, been uh, diminishing the populations of whales and dolphins and seabirds and the fishes and that. And these are the species that provide the nutrient base for the phytoplankton, the magnesium, the iron, the, um, and, the, and the nitrogen. Uh, literally, the, far, the whales are the farmers of the ocean. By providing this uh, material, they allow the phytoplankton to flourish. Uh, one blue whale every day dumps three tons of uh, feces or manure, I guess, into the sea, and uh, that, that's what provides a nutrient uh, base. And the reality is this. If phytoplankton disappears from the sea, we die. We don't live on this planet without phytoplankton. Uh, it is the basis of life. Uh, 70% of the oxygen supply compared to the forests of the world, which provide only 30%. So uh, most people are completely unaware of that. That's why I'm, I say all the time, if the ocean dies, we die. We do not live on this planet with a dead ocean. You know, it seems like uh, people forgot what ecology means. I was on your website uh, earlier today looking around. At, you know, the whole world learned the word ecology, most of us anyway, in the 70s, what it meant, how we're all kind of connected, that that it is important that some slug or butterfly or little fish, we th- might think of them, well, they're expendable if we build this dam or um, enact this project or whatever, uh, and we can afford to lose a couple little critters. But uh, your your website brings that back up and reminds us we're all connected to this stuff. So what happens to these creatures eventually happens to us, right? Yes. Uh, you know, back in 1971, I, we put a billboard up in the city of Vancouver. It's in big, giant letters that said ecology, and in smaller letters that said, look it up, get involved. Nobody even knew what it meant. Uh, so we've come a long way in that respect. But there are three basic laws of ecology. Uh, the first is the law of diversity, that the strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon the diversity within it. The second is the law of interdependence, that all species within an ecosystem are interdependent with each other. And the third is the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth, a limit to carrying capacity. And when one species steals the carrying capacity from other species, that causes diminishment in both diversity and interdependence. And that's what's happening right now. We're living in what's called the Anthropocene or the sixth major extinction event. And what that means is we're going to lose more species of plants and animals between 2000 and 2065 than we've lost in the last 65 million years. And that's going to have devastating consequences uh, for the ecology of the planet and for our own survival. We cannot live on this planet without certain species, and uh, they're all interdependent. We can't live in a world without bees, without trees, without worms, without fish, without phytoplankton. And so our very survival is dependent upon um, this 
survival of all those other species. That's the law of interdependence. We're going to get into that a little bit more. I want to know if you can share with us at least one of those stories about your confrontations on the high seas that will bring it home about how direct action can make a difference, but how how perilous it gets out there. You're way out in the ocean by yourself taking on these gigantic interests. Uh, tell us one of those confrontations. Well, I can tell you about the, well, the one day that really changed my life forever. That was in June of 1975, and we were tracking the uh, Russian whaling fleet, which was, uh, we found it about 60 miles off the coast of California. This is before the 200-mile limit. And we had come up with this idea. We were reading a lot of Gandhi at the time, and all we had to do was put our bodies between the harpoon and the whales, and that would save them. And uh, so Robert Hunter and I found ourselves in the small little inflatable boat, uh, and there was a Soviet harpoon vessel bearing down on us at full speed, and in front of us there were eight sperm whales that were fleeing for their life. And every time the harpooner tried to take a shot, I would maneuver the boat and block his, his uh, aim. And this worked for about 20 minutes until the captain on the Soviet vessel came running down the gangway, and he screamed into the ear of the harpooner, looked down on us, uh, smiled, and brought his finger across his throat. And that's when I realized Gandhi wasn't going to work for us that day. <laughs> and suddenly there was an incredible explosion. This uh, explosive harpoon flew over our heads, slammed into the backside of one of the whales in the pod. It was a female. She screamed. I didn't even know whales could scream. And she rolled on her side and in, uh, with a shower of blood everywhere. And suddenly the largest whale in that pod slapped the water with his tail and dove and swam directly underneath of us, threw himself up at the bow of the Soviet vessel to protect his pod. But they were waiting for him with an unattached harpoon. And he was struck uh, in the head, fell back in the water, rolling about in agony on the surface, blood everywhere. And as this was happening, I caught his eye. And he looked straight at me, and then he dove. And now I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming at us real fast. And he suddenly came up under the water at an angle so that the next thing was to come straight down on top of us. And as his head rose up out of the water and I looked into this eye so close I could see my own reflection in that eye, that's when my light was changed because I felt that whale understood what we were trying to do because I could see the effort he made to pull himself back. His head began to slide back into the sea. His eye disappeared beneath the surface. And he died. Could have killed us. Instead, chose to save our lives. I, I, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that. But I also saw something else in that eye and felt it. It was pity, not for himself, but for us, that we could take life so thoughtlessly. And I began to think, why? Why were we killing these whales? They don't eat them. They kill sperm whales for oil, high heat-resistant lubricating oil. And one of the things that it was most highly prized for was with the construction and maintenance of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I said to myself, here we are, killing these incredibly beautiful, intelligent, self-aware, sentient creatures for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it hit me. We're, we're, we're insane. We're crazy. You know? And I vowed on that day, I'm going to do everything in my life to, do, to protect them, to fight for them. Not for people, but for them. But at the same time, that benefits people. And then uh, 10 years later, we sank Ice half of Iceland's whaling fleet. And, uh, <laughs> at the, and at, yes. uh, at the International Whaling Commission meeting, and a former colleague from Greenpeace said, I just want to let you know that what you did in Iceland was despicable, and you're, you're an embarrassment to the movement. And I said, yeah, well, so? He says, aren't you concerned about what people think of you? I said, no, not really. We didn't sink those uh, whaling ships for you or for any other human being. We sank them for the whales. Find me a whale that disagreed with what we did, and I won't do it again. Can you talk a little bit about how aware whales are? You talked about them huddling and knowing that they were this Russian ship was coming after them. Are they, they are pretty savvy to what the, the dangers that they face, and uh, you, you, you seem to get the impression that they figured out that you were there to protect them. Have you, have you had uh, sort of relationships with whales in terms of getting to know individuals or um, – uh, other kinds of uh, encounters that, that taught you a lot about them? I spent a lot of time with whales. Uh, back in uh, the 70s, again, I was in the Straits of Bella Bella when an oncoming pod of orcas were coming towards us. Got into the water in front of them with a couple of other people. And uh, this is at the time when people thought orcas actually ate people, which was a little crazy. But uh, as a pod was coming towards us, uh, it suddenly occurred to me, you know, these guys eat sea lions, and here I am right in their path. And uh, suddenly they, they disappeared, and that's even worse. <laughs> you know, and suddenly they're not there. You don't know where they are. And then they surfaced right beside us, and for some strange reason, I reached out, grabbed the dorsal of the one that was passing by me, and rode alongside, or pretty much rode the whale for about 200 meters. And then 
just got flung off and left in his wake. And I said to myself, well, you don't go up to a lion and pet it in the Serengeti, but here's the most formidable, powerful predator on the planet. Just let me ride along with him. And the fact is, is no orca has ever killed a human being in the wild. Wow. And why is that? I don't think it's because, I don't think it's because, uh, I, I, the, they, they dislike us. It's because they, they know what we are. Yeah. They know how dangerous we are. We're, we're talking with Captain Paul Watson. I'm sorry to interrupt you there, uh, Captain, but we're going to have to take a break. We'll come back. We're talking with Captain Paul Watson, a hero uh, who has uh, protected uh, whales and dolphins and other oceanic species around the world, put his own life on the line uh, to make changes in how the public looks at, at the oceans and looks at the denizens of the oceans uh, he's got some fights ahead. He's created a new foundation formed earlier this year. We're going to get into what it's doing and how you can help right after this on Coast to Coast AM. Uh, Captain Paul Watson, sorry to have interrupted your story about uh, your encounters with orcas. Let me um, return to that same topic with uh, some more recent news. We've been reading some stories uh, from oceans, I think the Atlantic Ocean uh, off of Europe, where orcas have been ramming uh, supposedly ramming different kinds of uh, sailboats. And I wonder if you can comment on what you think is going on there and how it relates to what you know about these animals. Yeah, I've uh, been involved with that uh, that incident. We're still in, in investigating it. And uh, they're not actually ramming the boats. They, they, they're targeting the, the rudders. For some reason, they find it fascinating to uh, go after the rudders. The interesting thing about it is that although a couple of boats have sunk because of it, uh, nobody's been injured. The orcas haven't attacked anybody at all, uh, but they're shooting at them uh, there. And recently, uh, there was one yacht that was arrested for shooting shooting at them. Uh, the problem with uh, that's facing the orcas in the Straits and Gibraltar's is a diminishment of fish, uh, so they're having a lot of stress on on their, you know, their existence. But uh, like I said, nobody's been hurt, and uh, it is illegal to shoot at them. So we're watching that very, very carefully. I tell you, every, every year when Shark Week comes on television, um, I kind of hold my breath about it. I mean, there's some great, they do some great stories and talk about, um, you know, some of the dangers that shark species are facing. But the overwhelming imagery is of de- deadly sharks that could uh, be man eaters or could kill people if you got too close. And, you know, I, I think uh, the message that gets across is sort of similar to the impact that happened when the Jaws movie came out. And the fact is, you know, I've, I've done stories about sharks and shark fin soup. I mean, it's something like 100 million sharks a year are killed uh, and they, their fins are cut off. They end up just drowning, dumped back in the ocean. They make this uh, tasteless, uh, completely without any nutritional value soup as some sort of a cultural status symbol. And it's just horrible. But can you describe in general what's happened with sharks, which ones are in trouble and, and whether – progress needs to be made in protecting them. Well, we kill about 100 million sharks every year, mutilate them and everything, and yet we call them the monsters. But the uh, every day, about 200 million people go into the ocean, every single day. And yet the average number of people attacked by sharks or killed by sharks every year is about five. Uh, it's actually more dangerous to play golf because more people die from bee stings and lightning strikes on golf courses and are killed by sharks every year. So it's grossly exaggerated. When it comes to the animals that can kill you, sharks are way down on the list. I mean, dogs and horses are way up there on the top. Uh, so it's uh, it's just a fabricated um, uh, scare campaign that's been started with Jaws but continues to go on. We need sharks. Sharks are absolutely essential for uh, a healthy ocean. And uh, one of the things that we do also is we, we, we're actually, humans are actually responsible for a lot of these shark attacks. And I'll tell you why, because the three most places in the world where shark attacks are more prevalent uh, is La Reunion Island, Indian Ocean, uh, Queensland, and uh, Western Australia. And all three of those things have one thing in common, shark kill programs. They, they call the sharks. They, they, they go in and kill them. Now, what happens when that happens? Say off La Reunion, you go in and you kill all the sharks on the reef. That creates a vacuum, which brings in sharks from the outside. And because it's a territorial thing, they're now struggling to maintain that territory. They're much more aggressive. So we're actually creating aggressive sharks because of that. But what I just find absolutely amazing is just how few people are attacked by sharks, considering how many people go into the ocean every day. 
we've wiped out so much of their food supplies in different places. You know, I, I think uh, maybe we can broaden the conversation into what's happening with other species. And it's, it seems like every week we hear about another one. I read an article in a Boston newspaper a week ago about the, the mussels on the East Coast are, are gone. I recall reading about snow crabs uh, uh, in Alaska are gone. The salmon are, have just vanished. Vast amounts of these populations are just gone. I mean, uh, that's us, right? Well, the reality is there is no sustainable fisheries anywhere in the world. We've overfished the ocean through uh, highly mechanized, industrialized fishing operations. And, uh, you know, we need a moratorium on that. If the oceans are going to survive or the fish are going to survive, we have to stop this highly industrialized fishing operations. There's $100 million fishing vessels out there. And when you spend that kind of money to build a ship, you have to catch a lot of fish in order to pay off your debt to the banks. And it's a vicious circle. And because and the reason they're building these big ships and using all these technology is because of the scarcity of the fish. So to counter that, they need more and more technology. So we're actually going after the fish with satellites, with 100-mile-long long lines, 100-mile-long gill nets. We pulled one net from the bottom of the ocean in the Southern Ocean. It was two kilometers set down. We pulled it up. It took us 200 hours to pull that net up because it was 76 kilometers long and weighed 70 tons. That was one net from one ship. And this is the kind of technology that we're fighting out out there. So we're simply overfishing the ocean. And uh, for, you know, the seafood industry will say, well, you know, a billion people depend upon fish, so it's in that question of survival. But that's true, but those billion people are people who go out in canoes off of Nigeria or the Philippines to catch a fish. The people who are destroying the ocean are the highly mechanized industrial super trawlers. Yeah, I've read about these trawlers that ha- they, they scrape the bottom of the ocean. They don't just uh, scoop up the fish that they're looking for, but scoop up everything else and destroy the, the, the environment down there as well, don't they? Yeah, it's an incredible bycatch. We've, uh, we've just managed a victory here in the last, uh, this year actually, with, with uh, the French trawling fleet was killing thousands of dolphins every um, every time, every season. And we finally managed to get the French government to ban it. Uh, got a lot of angry fishermen as a result. But, uh, you know, it's a bycatch. Uh, last year we caught one super trawler. They got, uh, they dumped 150,000 blue whiting because it was an untargeted species and just dumped them. So there, there was rafts of blue whiting lying dead on the surface for uh, about a kilometer long. And um, so the bycatch is inc- horrendous. For every pound of shrimp, for instance, that's caught commercially, another 22 pounds of something else has, got, has been destroyed in the process. You eat seafood? You stopped altogether, huh? No, I was raised in a fishing village in the east coast of uh, Canada. I've seen the uh, incredible diminishment of uh, of the fish in the sea. The, the you know the the uh, cod fishery, the northern cod fishery, completely collapsed in 1992. It's not it's not recovered, and um, there's just simply not enough fish in the ocean to continue to feed uh, the ever expanding populations of human beings. And we're literally taking the fish out of the mouths of uh, other creatures. And as a result, that's causing uh, diminishment. And since everything is interdependent, that's causing ecological chaos uh, in the sea. I mentioned before about shark fin soup, and I wanted to get your comment on that. I've done some stories on it, and there have been some, there has been some progress, legislative process, uh, progress, at least in this country, about shark finning. Um, wh- where do things stand with shark finning? I, I, it just seems so stupid because there's, there's no nutritional value to cutting off the fins, and it's such a horrible way for these sharks to die. Yeah, it's a cultural thing. It's a prestige thing. If you have a wedding in, say, China, and you want to uh, impress your guests, you serve them shark fin uh, soup. Uh, it, it goes for about $100 a bowl, actually. That's why it's such a status symbol. But, you know, sharks are also killed for many other industrial purposes. Shark oil, which you can buy them in, in, in any of the health food stores, for example. Uh, the, the products go into... Uh, industrialized applications and everything there's many reasons that they that they that they kill the sharks but we are slowly slowly getting uh legislation to to protect the sharks back in uh 2002 i took uh, uh you know a film crew out uh to to make a documentary called shark water and uh that went a long ways to uh enlightening people about the real necessity of protecting uh protecting sharks in, in the ocean Everything is interdependent and that. 
You know, it's funny, uh, a few years ago I had Brett Hume as a reporter for the Fox Network. He called me up and he said, did you say that uh, worms, trees, bees, fish, and whales are more important than people? And I said, yeah, I think I did say that. <laughs> he said, how, how can you say something so outrageous? And I said, well, because they're more important than people. And I'll tell you why. Because they can live here without us. But we can't live here without them. We need them. We don't live in a world without bees, trees, whales, and fish. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, we have to understand that we're not the most important species on the planet. We have to live in harmony with all of these other species. And if we don't, we're simply not going to survive. Let's broaden the topic a little bit to the oceans, the health of the oceans in general. There's so many challenges, and I, I don't want to preach at people too much. I know that they, they hear climate change and they want to tune it out immediately. Can you address the big picture challenges to the oceans and what's happening what you've seen with your own eyes, the changes that are underway? Well, I've seen incredible diminishment uh, in marine uh, ecosystems. Not only is it overfishing, but also plastic pollution, chemical pollution, sonic pollution, uh, and climate change, of course, is, is real. But I, I like to explain it this way. If you look at the, um, if you look at the planet as a, a spaceship, which is what it is, uh, we're on this incredible voyage around the Milky Way galaxy, and every spaceship has a life support system that provides everything we need, regulates climate and temperature, provides food, provides oxygen. And that life support system is maintained by a crew of engineers, and those are those species that keep everything running. And we humans, well, we're passengers. We're having a wonderful time amusing ourselves, but uh, what we're doing is we're killing the engineers. We're murdering the engineers. And there's only so many engineers you can kill before the machinery begins to break down and fall apart. And uh, we cannot simply maintain this if we don't have the worms, the trees, the bees, the whales, and the fishes. And uh, that's the reality of the situation. So we, our, our dependence as passengers on Spaceship Earth is making sure that we have a, a healthy crew to keep everything running. I've been reading about these incredible temperatures uh you know, in Florida, off the off the West Coast as well, and uh, I mean, the water has got so hot, the the corals are bleaching and dying, and uh, oxygen is taken out of the water to the point where these massive fish kills happen. Fish wash up on the shore. Can you uh, address what's going on there? Well, the reality is that the oceans are dying, marine ecosystems are breaking down, and they're breaking down because of diminishment of species within it, the diminishment of biodiversity, and because of incredible pollution. Uh, and, of course, climate change, well, these things contribute to changes in climate, and that, of course, then change, it contributes to more species diminishment and more problems. And, uh, you know, back in 2021, when I spoke at the, um, the COP21 uh, conference, the climate change conference in Paris, I said, you know, the solution to this problem is to do nothing. And what I mean by that is leave the ocean alone. Give it a moratorium. Let it revive. Let it repair the damage we've done to it. And a healthy ocean will uh, repair the problem. And, of course, that's not happening, but uh, that, I think, is a solution. A healthy ocean will solve the problem. You mentioned about microplastics in the water. That, that's spooky stuff. I, I imagine a, a whale that you know consumes so much, it takes in so much uh, plankton and, and water, um, how plastics might accumulate in, in those species, but what's it doing to other species as well? Microplastics in the oceans can now be found in everything from uh, zooplankton all the way up to the great whales, and also it can be found if, you're, if people eat fish, you've got microplastics in your body. It's, it's as simple as that, and uh, it's becoming, you know, what the problem with plastics is it breaks down in these tiny, tiny pieces, and those tiny pieces are infiltrating the entire living uh, eco, ecosystem. And it's an insidious problem. And uh, whoever invented plastic probably had no uh, conception of just that, that this could be, lead to death to life in our oceans. But uh, that is the reality of what, uh, of what is happening. And why is so much of it getting into the oceans? I don't, I, is it just uh, people throwing away plastic bottles? They break down and then flow into rivers and down into the sea? Well, that's a visible part of it. But, you know, you have these nodules that uh, are... Uh, dumped off of trough off of uh, the you know the cargo carriers and everything which are the the tiny nodules are used to make actually make plastic and they get into the ocean uh here's one thing every day you drive your car microplastics come off of the tires and that gets washed down into the ocean too and that's actually a major uh contributing factor our automobile tires so plastic, there's plastics in cosmetics, there's plastics in clothing. Uh, every time you wash your clothes, there's plastic gets into the uh, sewage system that it eventually gets into the ocean. It all goes to the same place. 
And so it comes from literally uh, a million sources, and uh, it all ends up in the ocean. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about these giant uh, floating gyres uh, in the ocean, the size of Texas and everything. Well, they're there. But the real problem is that the entire ocean is uh, polluted with microplastics. And that, I guess, it ends up in us. It does. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's certainly uh, – that's one of the reasons that uh, – People shouldn't eat fish, but other than the fact that we're destroying the fish populations, but it's just not good for you. There's a chef here in Las Vegas who's specialized in uh, what he tries to call, uh, what he calls sustainable seafood, uh, suggesting that people try something else that's similar to the kinds of fish that they're used to eating just to give some of those populations a break. Does that uh, kind of approach have promise, do you think? I call it the adaptation to diminishment. As we remove one species, we simply move on to another species. When I was a child, uh, turbot was considered a garbage fish. Nobody ate it. Mussels were considered garbage because they were dirty and they grew on pilings. But now that's what you get in restaurants, mussels. And even in the best restaurants in Paris and New York, turbot. Uh, you know, the, the cod is gone. And, uh, you know, the or, look, orange ruppy is a good example. Orange ruppy was in the marketplace in the 90s. Everybody was everywhere. You don't see it anymore. The reason being is an orange ruppy takes 45 years to become sexually mature, lives to be 200 years of age. It cannot compete with a salmon, which takes four years to mature and then dies. And uh, so we just fish them out, and then we just move on to something else. And this constant adaptation to diminishment means we move further, further down until uh, right now. I just saw a documentary the other day. They're harvesting jellyfish for industrial yeah. purposes. I mean, I never ever thought it get to the point where fishermen would be going after jellyfish. But uh, we're, we're literally taking everything we can, everything from sea cucumbers to uh, things that you wouldn't possibly even dream that people would eat, but in fact they do. Uh, we're eating the ocean alive. Uh, the salmon, uh, you know, that's a really popular fish. And boy, those populations have vanished up in the Pacific Northwest, in Alaska. It's an amazing transformation in a short amount of time. And one of the reasons for that is domestic salmon farms, which with the production of cheap salmon on these farms, which is a very uh, antibiotically, chemically intensive industry. And uh, these are basically concentration camps of salmon. But what they do is they, they uh, spread viruses from the farms into indigenous salmon populations. And that's one of the leading causes of the decline in wild salmon populations, the zoonomic transmission of viruses. And this is a major problem in factory farms all together. Every, every year, you know, we kill millions and millions of animals in factory farms to try and keep a little lid on the transmission of, of viral epidemics. And because this is a result of uh, intensive uh, concentrated farming practices. So, uh, you know, you see salmon is probably one of the most uh, common fishes you see around. But almost, you know, I'd say 90% of all the salmon you see on the market is not wild caught. It, it, it was actually raised in a farm. And the problem is, is to raise one salmon on a salmon farm requires taking about 70 other fish out of the ocean and turning it into fish food for those salmon. So we're wiping out anchovies and mackerel and herring and everything for no other reason than to provide a cheap source of food for uh, salmon. We're also now looking at the harvesting of uh, zooplankton down in the southern oceans to turn that into a cheap protein paste to feed not only to domestic salmon also, but to chickens and to pigs. All right, already right now, factory farms uh, uh, are using fish meal, which is got, you know a fishing industry where about 40% of all the fish that is caught commercially is rendered into fish meal, which is then fed to pigs and chickens and that. We actually live in a world where chickens are eating more fish than all the puppins and all of the uh, albatrosses are put together. Jeez, wow. Uh, pretty grim stuff. Captain Paul Watson is my guest. and We're going to take a break. When we come back, maybe we'll try to look for some good news in here, a sliver of hope. Uh, some ideas on how you can get involved and help with this. 